Hello everybody, this is Havoc and welcome back to Against the Storm and our tutorial for absolute beginners. This is a tutorial series that will look to get you the basics and understandings of all of the mechanics, well, most of the mechanics, to get you right off on the right step. In the first part, we looked at our settings and how you can craft Against the Storm to cater to your type of notifications, your type of standardization, so that way you can experience the game in your own customizable way. We then took a look at the world map and everything associated with it, including Citadel upgrades, which makes your settlement more efficient from deeds to game history. And then we took a look right before you start your settlement. So this is where we left off. I renamed the town to Beginnersville, so I thought that was more apt and more important and quite a bit more relevant. Now, as mentioned, we have three sets of villagers we can choose from. We are going to rock with the beavers and the harpies because they have a, a several needs that align with each other, in which case we'd be able to satisfy those needs a little bit faster, a little bit easier, and therefore allow us to win a little bit faster. In terms of embarkations, remember that we have a limited amount and we decided to rock with some villagers. We went ahead and got a small farm, which means we start out with a small farm. And I think we went with stone. Yes, yes, I remember correctly. That way we can do some things right off the bat. We are on veteran difficulty, which if you will remember, means that we have four negative modifiers, one positive along with all of our additional effects. All of this I went over in the very first video, so if you need to have a refresher, definitely go back and watch. Otherwise, if you're ready for the settlements, we're ready to dive in. And this is what you'll see right from the very start as soon as your settlement loads up. This gives a layout on all the additional effects that we start with, as well as our forest mysteries. So again, if you'll remember, we have an abandoned settlement, which means we start with some destroyed buildings we need to rebuild, but could give us a good head start. And then our royal woodlands give us a lot of wood. They give more wood than normal, which is going to be nice. Now, during the storm season, at least on the lower difficulties, you will always have at least one positive modifier. On the very lowest, you'll actually have two. In this case, it's a forest offering, which means that during the drizzle season, get to that, every dangerous or forbidden glade events gives you 30 random raw food. So... You have to think about that right off the bat. We need to make sure that we only complete a dangerous or forbidden glade event during the drizzle season. That way we get that raw food. Otherwise, we won't ever do it. That is active from hostility zero, which is what we are now, which means that from here on out, that will always apply in our positive modifier. Now, we have five negative modifiers. And you see these increasing numbers right here. These are our hostility levels. We'll address it but essentially straight from the get-go from hostility zero is looming darkness this will happen every single game you cannot escape the looming darkness which means that during the storm season when all of these are active you will get minus four to global resolve for each hostility level that means that were we to get to hostility level seven which you can get higher that stacks hostility level two it's minus eight to global resolve etc etc your global resolve is the happiness level of your species that are in your settlement. If it drops below zero, they will start to leave. And on the condition that they do leave, then you will gain impatience with the queen. Not something we want to have happen. On hostility level two, we get no contact. Gaining reputation doesn't lower impatience. The way this works is that basically, as every time you gain an impatience level, it knocks back, or reputation, excuse me, Gaining reputation does not lower impatience. I messed that up. But basically, the way the game works, as you gain reputation, your impatience will get lowered. So, during the stormy season, the no contact will apply, which means that if were we to gain reputation during the storm season, we would not have our patience lowered, which is a big deal. So anything we want to have done, if it's a dangerous glade event, we need to do it in the drizzle season, but we also need to make sure we don't gain any reputation points during the uh, during the stormy season. We also get resources you sacrifice in the ancient heartburn 40% quicker at level two. So we actually have two level two modifiers, which is not good at all. On the condition of getting to hostility level four, every dangerous or forbidden glade discovered grants minus two to the global resolve during the storm. So this means that 
any events that we do, this will stack. And on the stormy season, we get minus two. So if we get to hostility level four, this is just some context for you. Say we had five uh, dangerous or forbidden glade events uh, or glades discovered. That's going to be minus 10 to global resolve there. And this stacks four times as well. So it's minus 16. So that means minus 16 plus minus 10, for instance, if we were to open up five of those, means we will suffer a minus 26 to global resolve, which means that in this case, we really, really need to work on getting our resolve as high as it can be. And that's what we'll focus on. And then last, were we to get all the way to uh, hostility level seven, villagers with this fact have a 5% chance of perishing every 15 seconds. That's terrifying. And that will apply to everyone. To prevent it, we need to fulfill the following services, which is uh, service times two, which means we need to offer them two different forms of the service that they require in order to negate this effect. That's probably not going to happen. So we just don't want to get to that point. All right, so we see our effects, we see everything going on, and here is our, oh, I, I can never get over looking at these settlements because they just look so daggum good. I really love the art style. There's lots going on here. Oh my word, are there lots going on. But again, I'm gonna try not to overwhelm you. We're gonna start as we did in the last video in the top left corner of the UI. And we're going to go clockwise from there and then look at some buildings and things. We're gonna start with our population. Our population is broken down both into an overall view as well as a per species view. In the overall view, we see the population idle workers, and homeless people. Everyone's homeless. We got to do some homeless things and get some people some homes. But you see, we also have all of our species. We have humans, beavers, and harpies. Now, this is fantastic because although we only have one human, humans are good for farming, and we want to do farming. And we can see we have some fertile soil over here. But anyways, let's get this breakdown. The same breakdown of population, idle workers, and homeless applies to the breakdown of each species. So we can see that we need to get all of these people housed. Now, this is the global resolve I was talking about. This is their happiness level. And again, it can be, um, if you get the global resolve, excuse me, over the reputation threshold, which you see is 30 for humans, then it will actively grow our reputation. Our reputation, you see, high resolve is currently zero because we don't have any high resolve. For harpies, that is very low. We only need 15 resolve in order to get them to start gaining our reputation. So it's not too bad. It's not too, it's not too terribly hard. Now, among this, you see all of these buttons here. These are modifiers that will increase and or decrease in this instance, the resolve level of your human or your species. We can see that basic housing gives a maximum bonus of up to plus three. So if we build a basic house, we can do that. If we were to build a species specific house, we could have another bonus of up to three, which means they would get plus six because one, they're housed, they would get plus three for human housing. But that's what we need to do as well. That is a very positive thing. This is a complex food of porridge, complex food of biscuits. These complex foods, you can see the possibility is up to a max bonus of plus five. So if we were to fulfill all three of these, this would be three, seven, 12. Immediately, we have 12 additional resolve to make them happy. Same applies to all of these. So we have several complex foods. We have clothing, which for most, especially in this case, we have clothing which can hit everyone. So we want to focus on clothing. This is why I like having this panel open, because here in a minute, when we select some potential blueprints, we're gonna be able to see what we need right up front. And we can also see here that all three species need biscuits. So there is a lot of crossover. Rarely, in this case, I think this is pretty unique, but rarely will you have such significant crossover, which means you're gonna to have to think about your production buildings as your settlements go along. So we have this in mind. All of these things can really help. These are our services. So again, services times two means that for humans, we'll have to fulfill religion and leisure for beavers, luxury and education, and for harpies, treatment and education. All of these will go towards resolve. That's what that's there for. Next up, we have our rain punk systems. 
This will not be unlocked for you if you start from the very beginning of the game. This is something that will come in the future and what it essentially will do. We don't have any buildings that can do it right now, but you can find resources to collect these drizzle, clearance, and storm water, and then use these and enable rain engines in your building that will harvest that water and then use them to either increase production or increase the resolve of the villagers inside of it. It's a great system, but again, if you're just starting out, you're not going to be at that point. Next up, we have all of our resources. All of our resources are broken down into these five categories. We have food, we have building materials, consumable, crafting, and fuel and exploration. And we get a breakdown on everything that's going on inside of those. As well as when you'll see when we start uh, working and we start having our settlement, that this will either go up or down when consumption is higher or lower than what is being input. So if our input on wood is higher than our consumption, you'll see a green arrow go up. If wood is being consumed faster than it's being produced, it will go down. It's a great indicator that you can kind of keep your eye on for all the different resources that you'll experience in the game. In the center here is a lot of stuff going on. For one, you have your drizzle year as well, or your year, excuse me, as well as the season. There are three seasons in the game, drizzle, clearance, and storm. Now you can modify how long these are based on certain factors with the game but you will have three seasons that make up a single year. And remember that every year you have in your settlement applies to the overall timeline. If we spent 10 years doing this game in this settlement, we would get 10 years knocked off in between the cycles. So this just gives you a good idea. We have four, four minutes of real time until the next clearance season, and then it'll go into the storm. And that's where all these negative modifiers will kick. Now over here is our hostility level. The forest is hostile, it just is. And it is alive in many ways. And as such, it has a hostility level. And this is affected by a lot of things. You can see here, every year it increases by 30. Every small glade we open up increases it by 10. Dangerous forbidden glades by 20. The number of villagers, woodcutters. Those all apply, as well as external things like events, or maybe perhaps cornerstones that we've chosen or other perks or disadvantages will apply here. And then we have the positive modifiers. For every hearth that you have, it will decrease it by 30. There's a balance here in that the queen's impatience actually can incentivize you and lower your hostility. So for every one impatience we have down here, it will give us 15 hostility reduction. Now it's important to remember that this level can be modified. We could get rid of villagers if we wanted to. We could, uh, if we had 10 woodcutters, which would be 160 hostility, we could decrease them and remove them all instantly to decrease the hostility level during the storm, which could potentially save us on some effects. Now, mind you, if you don't have enough wood, then that's a big issue because you need wood inside of your hearth. But it is a potential strategy. And then down here is your, your timer modifier. Uh, one through five will actually uh, enable that one through four, excuse me. Now what you'll see over here are again, all of our modifiers, any modifiers that is over in this section that doesn't have this means that these are going to be active, meaning at all times forest offerings will be active and at all times looming darkness will be active, even though it only applies during the storm. So that's important to keep in mind. Now in the future, you'll have a lot of stuff pop up here. We'll address this in just a little bit as these pop up. But one thing, these are your trade routes. We need to build a trade center and a trade post. We may get there in this series. Uh, and in which case you'll be able to trade with the smoldering city and or other settlements. One of the best parts here is the recipes. And this is what I meant earlier in the settings. In that look, I already have a production limit on all of my resources. I have already preset all of these to be able to handle it. Now I can modify them at any time. 100% and it will be great. And I can also show everything that isn't available inside of my city. And that's that's very nice. That's very handy. I absolutely love this system because it enables me to not waste resources. Now, as you just saw, if I click on any of these, as long as it is a product, I can see not only what makes it, but what level it makes it and how much it makes. Now the level means that the lower the efficiency, the more base product it consumes to create the product. 
in this instance, a flawless cooperage and a flawless druid's hut will only require one fabric to make 10 coats. Now that's pretty darn good. However, at the very basics, a druid's hut would require three. Now there's no guarantee that we'll get a druid's hut or a flawless druid's hut or even a clothier, but we have the opportunity to, and that is the important part to remember. And we can do this for all things. We can see we can get mushrooms, a greenhouse, although it requires drizzle water. Meat can come from a ranch. Eggs come from a ranch, as well as being harvested. But we also have ingredients along all of those same lines. This functions, though, to show the opposite. Whereas in your product, you see the base product and what it creates. You now have over here the ingredient of barrels can be used to make this or that. And then, on top of that, if you have the capacity to build it, you'll be able to say, okay, I wanna build that right away. The recipes list is crucial, especially as a beginner where you don't know what can build where or how or when and what products they use or consume. It's a fantastic system. And of course, only by showing all, you see everything that you can make right now, which is very, very important or especially for beginners. You also have the consumption tab. We talked about this very briefly, but essentially you can limit what a certain species can consume. Now, I'm not gonna lie. I am not to the point where I min max so hardcore that I utilize this, I'm not gonna lie. There are several people, including some of the creators who have spent more time in the game that will use this. But essentially what it does is it gives a breakdown on what everything from complex foods, clothing, services, and raw food, what impact they have. Consuming raw food doesn't do anything aside from helping them not starve. But we can see here, porridge gives four, biscuits gives five, and five for pie, five for clothing. And we can see that were we to enable all of these, that humans would get a plus 35 to resolve. Beavers would get plus 46 to resolve, and harpies would get plus 39. And considering they only need 20 to get to the uh, threshold, this is a great way to see what you need to do and what are the current effects as we're playing. It's a great tab to reference, but again, I don't really mess with consumption because I'm just happy to still get through settlements without dying. We are going to progress just a little bit in just a second, and I'm gonna show you some other things that pop up as we go. But down here is probably the most important section that you need to consider. Here are all of your buildings for one. This gives us our roads. This sets up everything that we have currently available to us, as well as the number of items being built. That way you're not over, you're not wasting, and you're, you're kind of keeping an eye on things. This allows us to mark trees. Remember, we have the setting now where we are not going to uh, do anything, but uh, we're not gonna open up glades, but we can totally have them cut open. And this is how we'll manually cut open our glades is by saying, hey, you will prioritize this set of trees and it'll be all good there. And of course, this allows you to destroy a building. But more importantly than that are your reputation and your reputation goes up all the way to here and reputation impatience goes the other way. Now again, reputation can be gained through various things, primarily through completing orders, but also through high resolve, also through different events throughout our map. We can make choices, in which case, usually we either get resources to a degree or we can send it to the Citadel getting Amber, which is the gold currency resource, or, and we get reputation on top of that. So again, the goal is not to have the largest settlement. This is a large map. This is a ginormous map. And barring that you're going after a specific deed, you're not going to need to expand that far. And so you'll wanna finish your reputation before the impatience runs out. And you see right here at this moment, Queen's impatience is 0.18 a minute. Now that doesn't seem like a lot, but it does add up as well as having other things. Now. Blight rot is something that we haven't quite addressed yet. There is corruption in this world. This rain is quite honestly, it's not safe to drink, it's not safe to consume, and it does have corruption that goes with it. And so what we can do by, um, this is a little bit of a later game, so I have to mention this, but your rain punk mechanics of storm clearance and drizzle water, you can use them in those engines as we will find out, but it does increase the hearth corruption rate. 
is going to be right here. And on the filling of this blight rot, it'll kill three random villagers and we will have corruption that comes throughout here. Now we can totally build a blight post, which allows us to essentially burn those blight rot uh, blooms with fire, with a holy fire, and that will reduce our corruption. So it's something we have to keep in mind of, and it can totally get out of hand, especially when you have a lot of rain engines running. So just be wary of that. The last thing we're going to look at for now are all of your perks. So you can see in this corner, and it will build up and build up as we continue our settlement. This is a culmination of every perk that we have. So right now we have the gift of the woodlands, an abandoned settlement, and we have light as a feather, which means that because we have a harpy inside of our ancient hearth, who is keeping the fire, global carrying capacity is increased by five. That means every single one of these people can carry more resources. And that's great. That's a great incentive. Each different uh, species will have their own thing. In this case, impatience grows 25% slower if we put a, uh, a human in there. In this case, fuel consumption is decreased by 20% because we have a beaver in there. Now this may be good to switch out in the later date, but I really like the harpies because we're gonna be able to carry. And that's simply that. to continue on. <laughs> it's gonna be a while. I feel like this is a grand strategy game uh, in many respects because it's gonna be a while before we finally hit play. We have several buildings here. You'll always start out with a main warehouse, which will allow you to uh, designate how much, um, how much resources you have you can track those. We can even now put people inside of them, which will allow us to deliver and take goods. I haven't utilized that yet. It may be worthwhile to do so. I just don't know. But we have other things to consider in here. We can salvage or rebuild this Explorer's Lodge. If we salvage it, we'll get some training gear and some pigment. That's great. But if we rebuild it, we get an Explorer's Lodge, which is a services thing. And well, hmm, it looks like it gives brawling and education. Now, two of our species require education. So we have this. We don't ever have to worry about potentially using a blueprint to get an Explorer's Lodge. That's pretty darn good. We have a forum, which is another, another uh, services building, which is awesome. So again, we could salvage it for goods, or this will do leisure and education. Well, education and leisure. So we could even tear this down since we don't need brawling or we could leave it. We could get the forum especially and we will already not only have the ability to get biscuits and all that stuff, but we would now have the capacity to service all of our species. This is a great role for a settlement. I'm not going to lie. And then last, we have a stamping mill, in which case if we were to rebuild, we would get the stamping mill. So we have to have the resources to do so. And one thing to mention, if you hover over any resource, you not only get a breakdown of where you can build it, where it's built most efficiently, but also the highlighted blue means that the crude workstation is currently the only building we have which can make it. And then the box with the 21 on the side says that, hey, we have 21 bricks. So in theory, we could make this forum happen right off the bat. Not going to, but we could. The same with our stamping mill. We could do the planks right off the bat, which, Honestly, we might. Your hearth is the center of your entire settlement. Any building or any house rather that is outside of this yellow marker is going to have a negative modifier. Uh, they will not be protected from the stormy season when we get to it. So you wanna make sure that all of your housing and your services and your decorations are inside of this, which means that you can build industrial centers outside. I highly recommend you do because we don't have a lot of space. And we can make more space by cutting down trees and stuff. But you'll notice a lot of things. For one, you need a keeper. And again, we have that uh, that carrying capacity. So it all works. We have allowed fuels. Now, this is important because at any given time, you could sacrifice these resources uh, in a certain particular order. So we could say, hey, actually, I don't want oil being used, even though it gives me 30 seconds worth of fuel per second or per resource. But I like all these other ones. Ah, sea marrow. We'll only do coal and wood. And we'll see that wood cycles through one wood every 14 seconds to keep the hearth lit. Coal is made to last for 48 seconds. So that's a long diff. That's a huge difference. So if we want to, we can totally have coal. And if we have the capacity, which you can see we have a mine, if we find the mining resource of coal, 
We can extract it, use it in there only, and then we wouldn't ever need to use wood. We could use those for other things. Sacrificing is during those hard times when you want to try and knock down a modifier, especially a negative modifier and knock down the hostility level. This means in addition to what goes on here, you are sacrificing 36 wood per minute or 18 coal per minute, 18 sea marrow, 14 oil. However, you'll see here, 36 wood per minute grants a hostility reduction of 50, which can be stacked three times. So that means if you had the wood availability to, uh, you know, that's what, 108? 108 wood a minute? That would reduce the hostility by 50. Coal is 18 per minute, reduces it by 80 per stack. That means at three times, you'll be burning 54 coal a minute, but you're reducing hostility by 240. So if you had a massive, overwhelming amount of coal, you could do that. Now these last two are a bit different. Sea marrow, glade events work by 25% with an increase every time you do it for three times, which means that if we had a glade event in one of the glades we undertake, then it'll be increased by 75%, which is a pretty daggum good thing and could save you in a pinch. Your oil means that global production speed is increased by 25% stack three. See where I'm going with this? Now, this is why we have the automatic stop after storm, because if I had a lot of oil, I would waste it not thinking this isn't sustainable to do um, consistently unless your sacrifice or your oil production is just bonkers, which is possible, but it's not reasonable. And so after the storm where these two have the most effect in terms of hostility level, you'll be able to reduce that once the storm goes into the next drizzle season, you will be able to auto stop sacrificing. The last thing I want to mention here is uh, your hearth level. Right now, our hearth is at level zero, basically, or level one, I guess it would actually be. And so, um, you know, it's, it's at it's at level zero. Our hearth is at level zero, but we will fix that right off the bat. And you'll see here at level one, we get a plus two to global resolve and the resistance to corruption. So that means that if we get eight population housed within the range and four comfort decorations, we'll get level one right off the bat. So we're gonna work on that first for sure. Level two is a little more intense. It requires more decorations, more people, but it gives you a 10% to global uh, production speed. And then district level three requires services, which we already have, which is a great start. And then 10% higher chance to produce double yields. That is super cool. All right, we're still not ready to begin because we need to look at what we have to know what kind of buildings we need to produce. So if we were to hover over any wood, you'll see here that this lush tree has two charges, means that a species can use it twice before it's uh, removed, would we'll give you a 100% chance to get wood, plus a 15% chance to get resin, a 10% chance to get, uh, that's fiber, and a 5% chance to get eggs. There's the possibility to get all four of those. There's obviously a very a not likely chance of getting all four of those, no matter what you're guaranteed the wood. But this is a cool thing. That means that you don't have to rely on other resources solely. There's a low chance of getting these extra resources. So that's always nice. And then as you see there, gathered via a woodcutter's camp, we have that because it's blue. Next up, we see root deposits and you can click on these resources. This says 23 charges, in which case you get roots and a 20% chance to get herbs. And you can see here, requires a camp with a recipe or better. We have a small forager's camp, which isn't as effective as a, as a major forager's camp, but we don't have that building. So if we were to, we need to place a small forager's camp and simply click on it. And you'll notice that if we were to be way out here, we would be able to see, okay, I have roots right here. And then they need to be within the green. Boom, just like that. The same will go for our bleeding tooth mushrooms. We have our base resource, possibility of another resource, the building that it can be made. We have three resource nodes, which isn't normal, I will say. And this will give us fiber with a chance of clay in it. Now, we have, through our upgrades, gone from the small version of this camp to the full version of this camp. So there's no reason for the lesser one. We will have a full Harvester's Camp, which is more efficient at, at gathering those plant fibers. 
So you'll see here like mushrooms take 20 seconds, 20 seconds, 20 seconds. This takes four. So we'll be able to harvest those significantly faster. I always like to place all three of these down to make things a, a little simpler, a little easier. And it gives me a sense on what I have. Now, we are also gonna place a woodcutter's camp. I like to place two right off the bat, but you certainly don't have to. Now we are very, very crowded here. I will say this 100%. Uh, so we're gonna need to make some room for our houses. We'll get to that. Uh, and in fact, we'll just go ahead and say, hey, uh, we're gonna we're gonna take down the explorers. Much. But now that we know what resources we have to start off with, we can approach our blueprints. For every reputation point we get, well, for every blueprint reward tier, you can see each one of those diamonds, we will get a new blueprint. The queen starts us out with three. And this is where we're able to see what we need to do. So for instance, we could get a forester's hut, which we place by farm fields that produces resin and crystallized dew. Don't think we really need that right now. A ranch might be good if we click on the hourglass, we will see what it can use to create what? Its cost, the number of villagers, and again, what it needs to produce. For instance, uh, this is where we get our, our ingredient variation, which we had in the settings from the first game. So I can use eight plant fiber to make 10 meat, or I can use vegetables or grain or reeds. But so this says, hey, we can use all three of these, or all four of these ingredients. If we want to make leather, it'll take two fiber to make four leather, grain, and their appropriate amounts to make eggs. Now, we could certainly use meat. Meat's required for jerky. I do believe meat may be required for porridge. I couldn't tell you, to be honest. Uh, we could look into our recipes in order to find that. So that would be nice. It also uses drizzle water. This is what I was talking about with our water consumption over here. We could use a provisioner which would be nice, but we already have something that can make flour, so I don't need that. And while it certainly will allow us to make packs of provisions faster, it's not that important. Our trapper's camp is the upgrade from the small trapper's camp. So if we had large resource nodes, we would be able to harvest them, and that applies to all of these camps. So that camp that we placed down, that was the larger one, it'll be able to harvest the larger resource node. Not a great supply from our first, but we're gonna go with range. Next up, Smelter Clothier, uh, Rain Collector, and a Brewery. Now this one's a little bit difficult to choose from. A Clothier would allow us to make coats, water skins, and scrolls. Now, all three of our species need coats. Two of our three need scrolls. And so we could definitely roll with that one if we wanted to. And because it is a Clothier, it actually makes a lot of clothes for very little fabric. However, a Brewery produces ale, pickled goods, and packs of crops. Ale is required for leisure. Pickled goods is, uh, oh, I thought I, I thought the humans had them. It only applies to the beavers. So that's a pretty obvious choice for me. I would love to make ale, but clothier is going to be our better option. And then lumber mill, cellar, brewery, or a tavern. Now a brewery makes the beer and ale that we could do, as well as the pickled goods. The lumber camp, though, will make planks, and we do need planks, and they make them very effectively. Planks are one of the first starting uh, complex resources that we need to work on. So in my opinion, lumber mill. We have two things that can make scrolls now. That's all good. Great. And you can see there that it's now been added to our lists. So we could totally make one right here if we wanted to. Perfect. So now I think we can officially begin. And we're going to begin by starting on speed one. Now, all of your villagers, because none of them have been assigned to jobs outside of the hearthkeeper, they are going to start bringing in all of the goods and they're gonna start building. And you'll see here, when you see this, it means there are no workers. And this is where we get into fun specialties. And this is also where you'll be able to optimize. You can see here that a woodcutter's camp requires, or it doesn't require, but it can take three, uh, three villagers. You also see here, there's a special of specialization bonus of wood. If we were to select this, we would see beavers share that specialization. So we're gonna place two of our beavers in this. We're actually only gonna place one of our beavers in this woodcutter because our lumber mill also has a specialization. And so we'll use that there. Now you see my resources here. For every three wood, we make two planks for a maximum of 40. It's the same with the scrolls. 
we could enable wood or plant fiber and enable wine or pigment to make scrolls. Packs of trade goods are the same deal. We do have a leather, uh, a water skin product that we can make from our clothier. So a lumber mill would be able to make packs of trade goods pretty effectively right from the bat. But we still need to fulfill all of our other things. We have six people left. Specialization bonus in a forager's camp. Humans have that specialization bonus. And you can kind of see how this progresses. Now, you won't be able to ever fulfill specialization bonuses in all of your buildings. And that's because, well, not all species have the same specialization, which means we're missing foxes and lizards, where you can see lizards have warmth and comfortable as their trait, and we don't have any, and we never will get them. And so that can't happen. However, you can't optimize as much as possible. Now, at the beginning of every year, we get a cornerstone. That's what this is. We can choose from these cornerstones. We can decline them for goods, or we have a chance to re-roll. A cornerstone is a cornerstone of your city, which allows you to have a perk that lasts throughout the entire settlement. This is a lot. There's a lot of good things going on here. A well-rested worker means that villagers with the leisure need, which is only uh, the humans and the beavers, have a 25% chance of doubling their yield. If I knew I could guarantee that leisure, I would do that. But we haven't chosen choices that even allow us to make ale or utilize that ale. So well-rested workers does not work for us right now. This is a long-standing thing that you could do if you knew 100% you could obtain it. Now, Obsidian Runestone is a complicated runic structure. The Ancient Heart's resistance to corruption is increased by 400. This is this right here. We could increase it to 1400 if we so chose. We're not going to worry about that. I don't anticipate needing it, so we're not going to do it. Now, this root delivery line literally just says you get three roots a minute. Now, that doesn't seem like much, and it can seem, you know, I mean, that's a, a root every 20 seconds. However, if you didn't have roots at all, you could use this for a root production system. So we, uh, I, I tend to like these a lot because it at least gets us something that is able to be used. Uh, and then Guild Catalog, traders will have one more perk or blueprint for sale. That's a pretty hefty one that I really enjoy. However, hmm, let's go ahead and do, we'll do the three roots per minute just for kicks and giggles. And you see down there at the bottom that that perk has now shown up for you to be able to see everything. All right, so the woodcutters are going to go. We're going to put a non-species uh, specialized woodcutter there. They are going to be moving right along. But one thing I know I can do because of the productions and the things that I chose is I can lay down a paved road, which gives a 15% speed increase to villagers. Now, the reinforced road gives 25%, but we don't have any copper. But what I can do is I know that... If we get this stamping mill up, if we get this forum, they're going to need to go to the warehouse. Or this guy right here will need to as well. So by making these roads, they are going to be able to make that speed happen. Now, the next thing has come up. Orders. These orders come directly from the queen. And in order to fulfill them, we'll have to do certain things. Fulfilling them gets us a range of items. So let's take a look. We have three to start out with, and mind you, I selected this, so I would not be able to explore the other orders until I selected something from here. This is a great one. This is a great one to start out with. Problem Solver Exploration or Impetuous Explorer. If we went with this, this is simply complete any two glade events, in which case we would get 10 bl planks, a box of tools, and villagers, as well as the Queen's Grace, which is a reputation point. However, this isn't timed, and neither is this. So we need to complete two glade events, or we could cut through to discover three glades. If we got that, workers that are assigned to glade events will carry five more items. We'll get bricks and planks, and we'll get a reputation point. This says, hey, in 17 minutes, I want you to complete any two glade events. Now, these are big things. As a reward though, because this is a much more intense one, this isn't limited by time, this is, we would get plus three to pickle production, which essentially means that if I make one pickled good, 
I now make four pickled good. So that's a really, really good positive. I always love going for these because it means that you get to make exponentially more resources for the same base ingredient price. Not only that, we would get a weaver, which is able to make fabric, and we would get three parts. The kicker is, is I just don't know if I can complete this. And if I don't complete it in 17 minutes, then I don't get the benefits of this at all. These are guaranteed if I complete them, and I can complete them. But this, this reward, oof. Oof. I'm, I'm contemplating whether I could do this or not. Let's go ahead and go for it. Awesome. So now I have 17 minutes to do that. Our next order is relatively simple. Keep harpies resolve above 13 for 30 seconds. If we did that, we would get two harpies, basket of berries, and some parts. If we sold goods worth at least 15 amber to a trade route or a trader, we would get 10 amber, 20 oil, and two additional vessels. Or villagers, excuse me. And again, the reputation points for both are great. We can easily do this, and we can do this very quickly right off the bat. So we're definitely going to choose this just so I can show you. We're going to pick another order, in which case it's just like the one we did, except for each different species. So we need to keep the human resolve above 22 or the beaver's resolve above 18. I'm not sure which would honestly be easier. So it depends on whether I want grain or whether I want roots. I want roots, so we're going to go with that. And you can see in 10 minutes, we get two more orders, 22, 2, etc., etc. Now, when we exit out of this, we now have our orders popped up here so we can keep track of them. It's awesome. I love it. It's such a great system. And so we need to go after two glade events. Do you remember how I said we didn't want to have our beavers explore glades? Well, now we do. And we need to do it rather quickly. And so we need to figure out where we want to go. I'm going to put a beaver guy over here. We're going to cut up these two and hope that there are events in there that are, are relevant and will count. But one thing we also have, we are, you know, um, um, two minutes left in the drizzle year. We need to make housing. Now, the big shelter is something that I've unlocked already. This is something that has to be unlocked. So if you're just starting out, you won't have access to this. And in fact, you won't have access to these either. These are simply upgrades that I have done in my time playing. You will start out with a shelter. It is a basic, uh, basic housing, costs 10 wood, houses three residents. We have 11 residents, which means we need four houses. Now you can build these however in the heck you want in whatever way you want. I like building them to where the, the middle part right here all matches up. It looks really cool and I'm a big fan of it. So we're definitely gonna do that. And in fact, because it's not built yet, I can always move my woodcutters, but I can move this guy here, this guy there. And then once they cut through, they'll be able to do that. In fact, we could just, no, we could just keep it like that. And now we're gonna super fast forward time just a little bit because they're gonna continue building all the things. You can see here the small herbalist camp has uh, chemistry, I think it is. So they're going to have a benefit of going there and harvesting that. And then there is no specialization for harvesting uh, plants at the harvester's camp. Uh, but we do want to keep a couple of builders left over. Because as these guys harvest the stone or harvest uh, wood, they're going to be able to build those houses. So again, they're building in the order they need to. We could set priority levels, which will be higher for the houses, in which case they'll focus on those houses because again, we want to try and make sure everyone is housed next storm. There's one house. Awesome. You can see it's rolling. We're going to move this guy over here. We're going to move this dude over here. And the reason for that is I like to, I like to stylize my cities. You don't have to. But I like to keep my settlements organized and I like how they look. We need four comfort decorations. Because once we get done building these houses... We'll be able to fulfill the population requirement. And now we'll just need that. So these are color coded. Super simple, super easy. Comfort, we have aesthetics, and we have harmony. Right now, we only need four comfort. 
And so there's a, a style that I have uh, started using that I really enjoy, which involves a little bit of the rain punk aspect. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to place two benches and two pipe endings. Now that sounds weird, but I have the ability to make further down the line. So it makes a cool little park that I like using. And they are going to build those up. Now we're going to put this as a priority because we are now in the clearance and we only have three minutes before the storm and I want to try and get that plus two global resolve. So here we go. That's being constructed. Great. And look at this. We have just by getting housing up, we have increased our beavers resolve, which gets us a reputation point, roots, and those gears. So we now have two more beavers. Not only that, we have a new reputation. The reputation point gets us access to a range of new blueprints. And this is kind of how the progression happens. And this is what I really love about it. So we can see we need biscuits. We haven't, we don't have anything that can produce biscuits. I don't think. We can look here in the search bar. Did I misspell biscuits? I did misspell, misspell biscuits. That is embarrassing. All right, so you can see here that biscuits require a, at least in the field kitchen, which is the only thing we have at the moment, consumes a ton of flour and a ton of other resources. Now we could go ahead and build that because we probably should. That does mean we would need to build this, which we can. The furnace allows us to bake pies, but pies are only two of the three. Yeah, we're gonna go with the furnace because we can make bricks, copper bars, that's a good one, yep. And so now we have access to that building, as well as the clothier that we picked from before. We don't have the space for it, but that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But you'll also notice we're so close to getting our Harpies Resolve. What we can do in temporary circumstances, we can favor a species. Now there are instances which we can't do that, but that's okay. But you can see this, favoring will boost their resolve by five, other species will fall by five. We can afford that. All we need is just, I think, 30 seconds, maybe two minutes. We can take a look here um, for 30 seconds. So we can boost this and they will start climbing up. And not only that, but because that's blue, that means their reputation threshold. That means we are actively gaining I resolve uh, reputation. Now it's not gonna last for long. We only need it for 30 seconds and that's all I'm gonna do. But this is just gives you an idea on how you can complete those events very, very quickly. And you see here, they're starting to build our decorations. Yes, and our village has increased. Our hearth is now at level one, which means we get plus two. We're gonna do this. We now get plus two overall. And now we see the requirements for our next neighborhood level. We need two more villagers four more comfort decorations, and four aesthetic decorations. Aesthetic decorations will cost more. It will cost our uh, our planks instead of just wood. But you now kind of see that progression. We've gained another reputation point. And in these first five reputation levels, we get new blue. Now, what do we want to do here is the big question. I already know what I'm going to do here. We're going to go for a plantation. So we now have a plantation, which gets berries and plant fiber. Plant fiber is useful for making, uh, I actually think we can feed things to uh, our ranch to make meat and leather and other things. Um, but it also is used to make clothes and what. Vegetables and grains are all made for food consumption. So we have a really, really awesome start here that I am incredibly excited about. But also this means that we can replace our beavers so our woodcutters are all using the, the best species possible. But we still have five, uh, five villagers left. Now there's a couple of things here to note. So for instance, in this thing, this is a glade event. Oh, this is a glade event. I didn't realize this, ladies and gentlemen. If we complete both of these, by the way, uh, that this is a trick that I just did. If you hold shift while you select a species, it will fill it all with that same species. We have the capacity to rebuild this. You gotta hit investigate. We want to rebuild this as well, and that is possible on top of that. Those are glade events. We could get our glade events there without having to do this and 
then we'll get our pickle jars, our weaver, and our parts. Let's see if this is true. And they're also only going to harvest around the glades, so we don't have to open those yet. So I'm actually going to put them in places where they can uh, expand the settlement and start clearing things out. It does work. Oh, this is this is fantastic. I was not expecting this. We're going to go through our first storm season, and then we're going to be done with the episode. But look at this. I am so happy. This has been probably one of the best starts I've ever had. I will say this. And so it's perfect that it works for the tutorial. Now, we're about to hit our, our storm year. And you'll see it changes. There we go. Because of my settings, we have space, uh, or we, it is automatically paused. Now, we are already at hostility level one. We have reached over 100 hostility from our villagers and our woodcutter. And unfortunately, it's not enough with our hearth the way that it is. Now, that means we get plus, or yeah, minus eight resolve because we have two stacks of the looming darkness. There we go. You can see it is dropping significant. Now, I do know that this goes by percentages uh, and decimals, even though it doesn't show. So this is dropping by eight. It says seven, says seven, but it is actually eight. Um, but that's okay. If we wanted to, we could sacrifice wood. We have a decent amount of wood. It's two minutes, so that means it's going to consume 72 wood if we were to do that. But you see it negates that minus eight and brings it to minus four instead. So uh, it's, it's just however you want to approach it. I wouldn't do it this low. We can handle the resolve because it's still in the positive. And then we also got Impetuous Explorer, which now means we get plus three to pickled good production. Oh my word, I'm so happy we were able to get through that. And I have a weaver, which is going to allow me to more effectively use plant fiber to make uh, to make fabric, which I can then use a, uh, a, where is it, a clothier. So you see the progression here. We can get plant fiber to make fabric. We make fabric to make clothiers. And we can do all of that right off the bat. That is going to be a positive because look at the bonus buff we get from clothing. Clothing is going to run out, so we need to be able to use that as effectively and as soon as possible. But on top of that, we have another reputation point. This is exactly what we need, ladies and gentlemen. This has been seriously the best run, and I'm so happy that it's working out this way. We need a cookhouse. We don't need skewers. We can use pigments, but biscuits is the main deal. We quite literally have everything we need. Now, I will say, this doesn't always happen. And so I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't get too overhyped that this will happen every single time. This has been very largely a coincidence of events. We're going to salvage this because I don't need it. We don't need an Explorer's Lodge on top of a forum. Now, we don't have any leisure or education here. However, if we were to put three people here, they'd be our public lecturers. And we would get villagers are quick to implement newly acquired knowledge. The chance of producing double yields is increased by 15%. So if we were to employ three people here, we would be able to utilize that. We don't, it's okay. We do, however, need another house. And we need to make it quickly. Because homeless peeps are not good. And so if there were any effects that we didn't need to do during the drizzle, for instance, uh, during or during the storm, then we would make sure that we didn't want to, we don't do them now. But there's really nothing holding us back at the moment because this is the very, very, very early game. And so we're simply just gonna be able to cruise through this first storm without any issues pretty much whatsoever. Everyone now has a home, which means we get a little bit of a boost overall. And in a few seconds, the storm year is over and we have year two and this is where we're going to end but not before we address a couple of things now the level in which newcomers come to your settlement depends on various factors it's not on a yearly basis per se but regardless every once in a while you'll get some newcomers in which gives you two options and usually it's a balance of do you want more villagers or do you want some potentially more useful resources in this case I want two of these guys because we're about to start building some farms and we're going to start harvesting those resources and we need more humans. 
So we're going to go with one less person in order to do that. And we'll be good there. Now, it is the beginning of a new year. And we get a new cornerstone to pick. And these are all great. But we're definitely going here. And the reason why we're going here is this is one of my other favorite perks. In which you create a certain resource and you get an additional resource if you created enough of it. So in this case, for over-diligent woodworkers, we're going to gain three barrels for every 10 planks produced. That is super cut and dry. That means every 10 planks, I just get three free barrels. That is amazing. All of these are great, don't get me wrong, but I love these, and especially for beginners, because they're super important. And there we go, ladies and gentlemen. We survived our first year. We are off to a fantastic start, and we're going to have the end of our second tutorial video. Guys, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, always in the comment section below. But if you enjoyed the video, be sure to show your support by subscribing to this channel, clicking like on the video, sharing it to all your friends and family that you know and love who are playing this game, and also leave your comments because I do read them all and I do appreciate them. Thank you so much for watching. This is Havoc, and I'll see you in the next video.